the marginalist revolution was really a series of events rather than one event. Um, it really opened the, the road to modern economics. What the marginal revolu marginalist revolution was, was discovery, a co-discovery of a principle. We'll talk about the principle later. It's very straightforward. But the principle of marginal utility, where utility means satisfaction in this case. The three co-discoverers were an Austrian named Karl Menger, who lived from 1840 to 1921, um, a Briton, Stanley Jevons. He didn't use the word marginal utility, he used the word final utility. Okay. Menger didn't use any name at all for the principle. Okay. He just ex ex expounded the principle without really naming it, which is always fatal. Okay. You have to give something a name for it to catch on. Uh, Leon Valras was a, 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 a French citizen who then moved to Switzerland. And he used the name rarité for marginal utility. The term marginal utility came into economics when Menger's student, Frederick von Wieser, introduced the term Grenznutzen, which is German for marginal utility. Okay? It was, it, what what, what um, Wieser did was to translate final utility. He wrote in the 1880s. He translated um, William Stanley Jevons final utility into the German Gren term Grenznutzen, and when, when it was retranslated, when the Austrian books were retranslated into English, it was translated then as marginal utility. So we know it is marginal utility today. Okay. Now what I want to point out is the following. There was a big and important difference in conception in marginal utility between Jevons and Valras, who were both mathematical economists, and Karl Menger, okay, who was who is what we call a verbal logical economist. Um, in the case of Jevons and Valras, they actually believed volatility was a quantity, a quantity that could be counted up, that was subject to um, arithmetic operations like division and addition and so on. Menger, on the other hand, did not believe that marginal utility was any sort of a quantity. Really, he saw it as the outcome of a value judgment of individual human beings on the importance of different concrete goods. We'll talk about that. A much different conception. Menger discovered much more than the principle of marginal utility. What he actually created, a theory of price based on subjective value and individual choice. Okay. And in doing so, Menger became the founder. He founded the Austrian School of Economics. Um, Austrian economics is really no more than um, what we might call an ex exposition or an expounding uh, of the principles of marginal utility. Okay? That was, that was um, stated by Menger in 1871. Okay? Even the most sophisticated Austrian work, um, Man, Economy, and State, um, is the really spinning out of the logical implications of Menger's principle of, of, of subjective value. Which brings me to a little bit of, of um, uh, what we might call uh, affirming that, that, in fact, many important economists considered Karl Menger as the founder of the Austrian school. Let me just quote briefly um, some of the most important later Austrian writers. For example, Joseph Schumpeter, who was an Austrian, though he tended to follow Valras more than Menger, but he still was... Uh, in um, Austria during the period in which the marginalist revolution was going on in the uh, um, uh, 1890s, 1900s, and so on. And he said the following, quote, Menger is nobody's pupil, and what he created stands. Menger's theory of value, price, and distribution is the best we have up to now. And that was written in 1921-22, okay, full 50 years after Menger um, had um, written his book in, 18, in 1871. Okay. By the way, Jevons wrote his book in 1871 also, even though they were working independently. And Valras wrote his book in 1874. Okay. Now, Ludwig von Mies, really the, the greatest economist of the 20th century as far as I'm concerned, um, wrote the following about Menger. He says, Menger, um, excuse me, he says, what is, I'm quoting, what is known as, Austrian, as the Austrian School of Economics started in 1871 when Karl Menger published a slender volume under the title, and I'll give you the English rendition, Principles of Economics. 
Until the end of the 70s, there was no Austrian school. There was only Karl Menger. Okay. Finally, Hayek, um, who won the Nobel Prize in, eight, in, in, in 1974 and is one of the most well-known Austrian economists of the 20th century, he wrote, the Austrian school's fundamental ideas belong fully and wholly to Karl Menger. What is common to the members of the Austrian school, what constitutes their peculiarity, and provided the foundations for their later contributions is their acceptance of the teaching of Karl Menger. So there's really no dispute concerning Menger's role as a creator of the defining principles of Austrian economics. Now, what was Menger's basic aim? Okay. Menger was a journalist before um, he uh, took an academic position. And he looked around and he saw that, he was an economics journalist, by the way, he saw that prices on organized markets were determined in a very different way than the classical school of economics had claimed. Okay? As we'll talk about in a few minutes, classical school of economics had claimed that prices tend to equal the cost of production, the cost of producing the good. Or in some cases, the number of labor hours that go into producing the good. The ratio of prices reflect the ratio of, of labor hours. And Menger saw how prices changed moment to moment. And when the news changed, he was a newspaper man, too. Uh, prices would change. He said, wait a minute. He said, yeah, this is nothing to do with changes in cost of production. Prices change as a result of people's expectations changing, as a result of their preferences changing, and so on. So what his aim was was the following. He saw these objective things, these actual quantities that were exchanged on markets. And he, and he said, what I want to do is to establish the logical link or find the logical link between those objective quantities and the subjective choices, expectations, and values of human beings. Okay. So that was his project. Now, many people say that his project, that he was trying to overthrow the classical school of economics, that the marginalist revolution overturned the classical school of economics. Okay. That's not really completely true, especially not in Menger's case. Okay? Because the classical school of economics said a lot of, of uh, important and true things. Though, and, and they built up a mighty structure of economic theory. Though there were, it was a deeply flawed structure of theory, as, as we'll show. And Menger pointed out the flaws, and in fact, he corrected them. And that's what he wanted to do. Okay? His idea was to complete the classical project. Okay? Classical economists were very, very um, shrewd. Um, in particular, David Hume, Adam Smith, David Ricardo. They did see that in the short run, supply and demand determine prices. They admitted that. Okay? And demand, in some sense, depended on what people thought about goods. But they didn't explore that very deeply. What they did that was important, and I'll get back to their, their errors, was to point out that, look, prices are not determined by the whims of sellers. Okay? GM doesn't just set a price and say, you pay that price. Okay? Even big, large firms cannot simply set prices. Nor are prices set by historical circumstances. Okay? Because the price was something five years ago, well, that's what it is today. Or, or whims. They weren't just set by whims. Okay? According to the classical school, this was very important, and Menger um, himself took over this view, um, uh, prices were set by immutable, that is, unchangeable economic laws that were true in every period of human history. Okay? That, that was important. Um, and these laws were the laws of supply and demand. They did see that. Secondly, the classical school also realized that wage rates, rents, interest rates, price of consumers' goods, and so on, regulated production. That the amounts of goods produced, the different types of goods produced, SUVs, low-carb foods, so on and so forth, at any given moment in time, those are the result of monetary calculation of business decision makers looking at the structure of prices and anticipated prices and making their decisions based on the costs of the inputs and the anticipated price for the output. So, as Mises later pointed out, the classical school had a few calculated action. They focused on the businessman. They forgot about the consumer. Okay, They didn't explain to me very well because they were too focused on costs. But they did see that prices were determined by economic law that, that was that is as natural law or, or law in the natural sciences. And secondly, that production was ruled or guided by these prices 
as they were interpreted by businessmen. Okay. And let me just point, point out, they also had a sort of sophisticated theory of how prices changed, classical economists. Uh, two years ago, you didn't see any low-carb foods in supermarkets. Ten years ago, I guess, you didn't see any SUVs or many SUVs. Well, how do we have, how do we suddenly have today the plethora of SUVs and, and these aisles full of low carb foods, even even in supermarkets? Well, something happened, and that was that people's preferences changed. Now, the classical school didn't really talk about that. What they said, well, prices suddenly shot up. Okay, they started from that point. Okay, and here's where they were wrong, and we'll get to it. Prices price of SUVs shot up. Okay, so that there were now suddenly profits to be earned. Prices now were above the cost of production. A few entrepreneurs responded to this or, or, or foresaw or, 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 or forecast that the price of SUVs would be above the cost of production and therefore began to produce SUVs. As they earned profits, other entrepreneurs then began to jump in and produce SUVs. But as the supply of SUVs increased, what happened? Prices, day-to-day -day prices fell and they fell towards cost of production. So this theory of how production responds to changes in prices was, was completely true. Okay. But what it didn't explain was why prices changed. Why did they change from day to day? All the, cl the classical school misfocused on the end point. The end point was that over time, price of low carb foods will fall far enough so that everybody in the industry just earns a normal rate of return. And everybody producing SUVs just earns a normal rate of return so that there's no more incentive for anyone to come into the industry and there's no more concern for people or, or, or there's, there's no more incentive for people to leave the industry. In other words, that there was an equilibrium tendency in the economy. Okay? Unfortunately, because they forgot about the consumer, they put the businessman at the center of economics. And as I said, again, his actions were ruled by monetary calculation. And that, not enough. So it was correct as far as it went. Okay, now, why did they make, why did they make these mistakes? Okay. Well, basically, the mistake resulted from the fact that the classical school, when they analyzed goods, they did not look at concrete and that, that was Menger's favorite words, always talking about concrete units of goods. This comb, that pitcher, okay, this pad, Walter's haircut, okay, concrete, actual, objective units of goods that people make their decisions about. Okay? What they looked at were categories of cl or classes of goods. And this was the root of their error. They looked at diamonds versus bread, for example, or diamonds and water. Okay, let's use bread. And they said, and they also distinguished, by the way, between use value and exchange value. They said, well, looking at diamonds, diamonds have a very high exchange value per unit. Okay, but some of the things they have, a, 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 diamonds as a class really not needed to sustain human life. They're not even needed as a condition in human life. They're a mere frippery, a luxury. Okay? So their use value is very low to human beings. But on the other hand, bread has an extremely high use value in sustaining human life. Okay? But per pound, if you compare a pound of bread to a pound of diamonds, exchange value is very low. Right? So this was the paradox of value that they could not solve. Okay, known as the paradox of value. What they did was to say, well, economics should just focus on explaining exchange value, which is price, which is why they developed a, a, a theory of supply and demand. Okay. Use value is important for something to become a good, but they said nothing more about it. They said this was a necessary precondition of exchange value, but they couldn't make any logical connection between the two. 
Now, to go back to Menger, what Menger wanted to do was to show that how use value, which is a subjective value that individuals attach to goods, results in exchange value. How, and he changed the name, actually it was, it was later on, uh, von Bauwerk changed the name, to subjective value and, and to uh, okay, objective value being prices, subjective value being the um, importance that people attach to different types of goods and services. Okay, so that was one of their problems. Now, um, that meant that for the classical economists, value, since they're just focusing on objective value, was inherent in a good. Okay? You have a diamond, and that diamond costs 10000 that gem quality diamond costs $10,000 to produce. That value is stuck to the good. Okay? In some way, the process of production, its past history, the high cost of producing that diamond, infused the value into the good. The good's an objective property of, of, of the diamond, just like the other properties of the diamond. It's hardness and so on. Uh, one economist pointed out, uh, I think it was Edwin Cannon, um, who was a, a later follower of Menger, said that um, labor's sweat, labor's, if there was a lot of sweat in producing the good, that sweat, and he was being facetious, of course, seeped into the good. So if there was a lot of sweat in the good, it had a high value, a lot of labor hours. There's a little sweat in the good, okay, and uh, laborers didn't sweat too much in producing bread. Well, then, the value that was inherent in the good, that was infused into the good by the past process of production, uh, was, was, was much lower, okay. And finally, they, they, they also believe that the cost of production could measure the value of a good. Either the money cost of production, in the case of Adam Smith, okay, or to David Ricardo, the number of labor hours. Okay, now what are some of the implications of, of, the, of this? First of all, they had what we might call a, a bifurcated or split theory of value. How could they explain by cost of production the fact that uh, last year on eBay, a baseball card from, I don't know, the early 1910 or whatever it was, a baseball card with Honus Wagner's picture, an early baseball star, sold for $600,000. It didn't cost $600,000 to produce that baseball card. How can they explain that? Well, a few years ago on eBay, uh, the, the um, lyrics to I Am the Walrus by the Beatles, by John Len in John Lennon's hand, written in his hand, sold for, I don't know, twenty dollars or $40,000. It didn't cost John Lennon $40,000 worth of labor to, to pen those lyrics. Okay. They couldn't explain that. So they said, well, that's scarcity goods. Okay. So paintings by Da Vinci and so on, that's determined by supply and demand. Okay, that's not determined by the amount of sweat in, in the thing. Okay, um, but there's another class of goods that our value theory applies to, and that's reproducible goods. So you can't explain an SUV, current SUV, by um, uh, the, the price by the cost of producing it, but you can explain an antique Model T, its value by the cost of producing it, which is ridiculous. Okay, no sense at all. All right, so that was one implication. That was one of the problems with the classical school. Um, secondly, they made the mistake of saying, well, if there's, if the cost of production determines the value or the price of goods, then when two goods are exchanged, okay, at a price, their prices are the same, which means that they have the same value. Okay? Because they're only focusing on objective value. Right? So that when anything is exchanged, there, it, it implies or signifies equivalence of value. That's also a big mistake. Okay. And finally, um, the other mistake, and, I, and I've already talked about this, I'll reiterate it, is that they really couldn't figure out, because they got rid of use value, they, they didn't see that the consumer was the center of all economic activity. They focus on the businessman. And I don't want to go into too much. Um, oh, one other thing that they did do, uh, which Mises point, von Mises points out, is that um, they assume that things like, that you, they started from prices. You start from prices and businessmen buying cheap and selling high and earning profits or suffering losses. Then what do you assume? 
You assume that private property existed, always exists. You don't try to explain it. You assume that free exchange existed. You, you assume that sound money exists. In other words, you don't realize that these are institutions that are necessary for exchange. Okay, you just assume them at background, which means the classical economists weren't able to, to um, refute the socialists. Okay, the socialists said, well, we can do the same things without private property and so on. Okay, we, we can still follow the economic principle okay, of taking low-valued things and turning them into higher-valued things. What the classical economists di didn't realize and, and didn't um, use their argument against the socialists was that if you don't have private property, if you don't have sound money, if you don't, if people aren't allowed to alienate their goods, that is exchange their goods with one another, well then you can't have prices, you can't have monetary calculation, you can't have more SUVs produced when, when, when prices go up, and so on. Right? So that was another problem that they had. Okay, um, okay now what did, what did Menger do to, um, resolve the paradox of value? And I'll get to that. But, but how did he approach economics as a science? Okay. In his notes that he wrote to himself before he wrote his textbook, he had some very revealing um, statements. He said, man himself is the beginning and the end of every economy, unquote. Now, that, he, didn't, he didn't come up with that himself. There was a whole tradition, which uh, Dr. Hulsman mentioned last night, uh, on the continent, especially in, in French and Italian economics, in which they took man and the um, in a generic sense, and the wants of man as the beginning of of, of, of and, and cause of economic activity. Okay. The other uh, statement that Menger uh, wrote when he was very young, in, in, in the notes that he was, he was making to himself, he said, "Our science is the theory of a human being's ability to deal with his wants." Okay, and that comes from a, a free market French economist. Frederick Bastiat, who saw all of economics as an attempt to, to, to satisfy human wants. But what, what these earlier pre-Austrians did not do was to give us a logical link between the starting what they believed was the starting point of economics and exchange value. And that missing link was marginal utility, which was developed by Karl Menger. That's why he and not the earlier um, Italians and French and, and Spanish scholastics are why he is the founder of Austrian economics. Okay. Now, the other thing that he, he says in his treatise is the following. The very first line of the text of Principles of Economics is a very simple, short sentence. It says, all things are subject to the law of cause and effect, quote unquote. Okay. What Menger saw then was that man was both the means and the end of political economy. Okay. And let me just give you a little diagram to show what I mean here. That economic activity is a two-way causality. Menger said, yes, goods, okay, these objective elements of our external environment, cause satisfaction. So causality goes this way. Okay. That is, the consumption of goods causes satisfaction of wants. So that's consumption. The act of satisfying any of our human wants is an act of consumption. But he also said, wants cause the production of goods. Okay? Because human beings strive to satisfy their wants, they rearrange elements of their environment into useful things or things that are useful for satisfying their wants. So causality went both ways. Okay? Human wants cause goods. Goods cause the satisfaction of human wants. And um, Menger wrote out three trinities okay, he, he, in, in his notes. He wrote ends, means, realization. Okay? Human beings has a, have ends, satisfaction of wants. 
the means is the objective things in the, in the world. The realization is the realization of the satisfaction. He also wrote, man, external world, subsistence. Human being is the cause, or human beings see the external world, they see elements that they can use to satisfy their wants, and therefore they create subsistence from these things. And finally he said, wants, good, satisfaction. And wants, good, satisfaction comes right from, from um, the French economist, who I, I really highly recommend, very straightforward and great writer, of Frederick Bastiat. Now, so which meant that Menger was focused on goods. Okay, the first chapter of his book is the theory of goods, and his theory of goods was very straightforward. Okay? Brought the consumer into the picture right right away. Didn't focus on the businessman in the beginning. He said, "Look, there are four preconditions or prerequisites for a, a good, for a thing to be a good." He said, one, the human need. Okay? Someone's hungry, let's say. Um, two, he said that there must be an objective capacity in the thing to cause the satisfaction of that need. Okay? Or in his words, uh, there must be such properties as render the thing capable of bring, being brought into causal connection with the satisfaction of his need. So bread has a capability of satisfying hunger. But also, human beings must know about this causal connection. There must be human knowledge of the causal connection. In the early 19th century, when um, this black substance was bubbling up on farmers' land, which was, which was you know, crude oil or, or petroleum, um, no one knew that, that it had any power to... Um, fuel automobiles and, 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 you know, turn generators and so on and so forth. So even though there was a human need for, for more energy and uh, um, there, wa uh, there was an objective capacity for this thing to be turned into gasoline and home heating oil and so on, because people lacked the knowledge, it was not a good in Menger's, um, Menger's framework. Finally, he said, the human being must have command of the thing sufficient to direct it to the satisfaction of the need, meaning... The human being must have the ability to control the thing. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> for example, you might have a need for a sunny day because you're going to want to pick a, to a you're going to go to a, a Mets game. Okay. I don't know why you would do that. Well, they're playing better, but all right. So you want to you, you have need for a sunny day. Um, you know that a sunny day uh, occurs when there are no clouds in the sky. Okay. So you have that knowledge. Okay. You might have very technical knowledge of, of that. Um, you know the causal connection between the sunny day and enjoying yourself at, at the baseball game or the picnic. But the fourth precondition is missing. You don't, you don't, have, you don't have control over the weather. Okay? So it's not a good, according to Menger. Now, Menger made one mistake in listing these four prerequisites of a good. The one mistake that he made was to say that the thing must have objective properties in being the cause of the satisfaction of the need. Okay? And Mises pointed out that's not true. Okay, if that were true, you know, why would a snake oil and you know all of these uh, you know, these bogus remedies for various ailments? Why would they have prices? They've always had prices in human history. Things that supposedly cure people but really don't. Okay, um, why would um, people believe, for example, that Paul Samuelson's textbook actually imparts knowledge of true economics? Why would that have a price? Um, so on and so forth. Okay. Well, Menger actually wasn't that, Menger actually covered that. He said, well, there are some, he called them imaginary goods. He says, in that case, people imagine that they have a, a property to satisfy their need. But Mises said, look, you can take two and three and you can just combine them. And he combined them into the following. He says, people simply have to have an opinion or a belief that a thing has capacity to satisfy human wants. So there has to be a human want an opinion or belief that something in the external world has the capacity to satisfy that want and control of the thing. Okay. And Menger actually, again, in this category of imaginary goods, actually, ha actually um, understood that. Okay. He was basically making a value judgment, saying these are, these things, like Samuelson's textbook, really don't have this you know capacity to satisfy the need. And you know I would agree with him there. Um, okay. 
Now, he then went on to say, things like air are good, um, but it's not an economic good. So he distinguished further. He has, has a chapter on economic goods. Economic goods are those things which fulfill all four conditions, or three conditions, and yet are insufficient in, 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 in total supply to serve all the human needs for them. In other words, economic goods are goods that are scarce. Okay. In modern Austrian economics, we don't call things like air a, a, a good at all. Okay. Be, why? Because in a normal situation, we do not have to take any action to obtain sufficient amount of air. Okay. So that we don't distinguish in modern modern Austrian economics between economic goods and goods. Okay. Goods are those things that are scarce in relation to human needs. Now, many things are, are, are rare, but they may not be scarce. For, for example, the, um, well, I was going to say, the, the, the malaria parasite used to be rare, coming back, but, but it used to be rare, but, but that's not a good. Okay? Why? Because it doesn't satisfy human need. Okay? Or the, the poliomyelitis virus, fortunately, is extremely rare. Okay? But it's not a good because it doesn't satisfy human need. Okay? On the other hand, air, which we need, you know, um, without it for you know three or four minutes, whatever, uh, we would uh, we would die. Um, yet, even though it's so necessary to sustain human life, air is not an economic good because in a normal situation, there's more than enough available to satisfy all the human needs for it. Now, that's not true if you're a deep diver or if you're an astronaut. Their very costly means are employed to obtain enough air. Okay, so in certain situations, things like air become scarce, and they therefore become a good, okay, in, in Menger's sense. Okay, which brings us to the point where we can solve now the paradox of value. Okay, Menger solves the paradox of value. Now, this is all before he's gotten into, to, into the business, to, you know, to the, the um, world of, the, of, the, of businesses and, and firms and so on. He's put the consumer squarely at the center and at the beginning of economic science. And I'm going to use an example similar to the one that he uses to show you how Menger solved the paradox of value using the concept of margin utility. Okay, Menger wasn't afraid to reason um, in a way that was criticized by the German historical economists of his time, and that was to abstract from the real world of multiple people and many markets and so on, and to focus on an individual. Okay, that was according to him that was a completely legitimate and realistic way of reasoning. Okay, why? Because in fact we have to build up our explanations of more complex economic phenomena from principles derived from human individual action. So what he did was to say, uh, assume that the fictional character, Robinson Crusoe, is um, stranded on an island. He's alone. And um, he has various needs. Now, for Menger, these needs are concrete. Okay? That is, he needs, he needs bread, a certain amount of bread, just to stay alive. Let's say, um, but let's say that he's capable, has the knowledge, the technical skills and so on, of raising, of growing a uh, cro crop like wheat, okay, which you can turn into bread. Okay? So he can use one sack of, of, of wheat, and let's say he has five, five sacks of wheat from, from a, a harvest. Okay? And the first and most important want is to use one sack to bake into bread and that's just enough to sustain him for one year, okay? Just, just to barely keep body and soul together. His second use for a sack of wheat would be bread for health. In other words, second sack of, of wheat that he baked in the bread would give him enough bread to allow him to begin to achieve, have enough health and vitality to achieve other ends, okay? Um, the third most important use for a, a sack of wheat is really to use it for seed, for next year's harvest, so he can stay alive another year. Okay. 
because the wheat itself is, it becomes seed for a uh, harvest uh, one year in the future. Uh, then fourth, he would use a sack of wheat for feed for farm animals. He'd raise some chickens, which he finds you know wild on the island, um, and maybe some some wild goats, so he could have dairy products and, and and he can have eggs and so on. Okay, so he can vary his diet. Fifth, he's lonely, so he wants to drown his sorrows by fermenting it, turning it into whiskey. Okay, and he actually did. I think he used brandy or something. Um, uh, but his wants are almost limitless, okay? So uh, there might be a six one. If, if he had a six sack, he would use it for to feed a parrot as, as a companion. He's really lonely. That's if he gets drunk. Okay. And, and so on. Okay. Okay, so now the question becomes, what's the value of a sack of wheat? Is it the value that you attach to your very life? Is it the value, is it an average of the value of these five ends that the five sacks of wheat can serve, okay? Is it the midpoint? What is it? What determines the value of a sack of wheat? Because remember, they're interchangeable. The first sack can be used for the for the fourth end. The fourth sack can be used for the second end. They're they're exactly the same in 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 their in their um, properties, okay? Well, Menger came up with an, a brilliant way of answering that question. What Menger said was the following. He said, assume that a fox breaks into um, the shed where, he's, where, where Robinson Crusoe is storing these five sacks of wheat. He's about to begin using them. And the fox devours number two, okay, one that he had marked as, as the second, go to the second end. Will Robinson Crusoe then go without a second um, sack of, of uh, turn into bread and do the first, third, fourth, and fifth ends? Of course not. Why not? Because the value of um, a second ration of, of bread is, is higher than whiskey. So no matter which sack is eaten by the fox, which end is going to be lost? Which end is not going to be served? This end. So, he's going to lose this utility, which is the satisfaction. Remember, I use the word utility. Uh, utility simply means satisfaction. It's the marginal utility. That is the lowest ranked end. So marginal utility is defined as the lowest ranked end, or, or actually, let me be a little more, more specific. Satisfaction from the lowest ranked end that can be by the supply of a good. Marginal utility is the satisfaction of the lowest ranked end that can be served by the supply of a good. So, what is the value of the five sacks? The value of the five sacks is the value or importance he attaches to a year's ration of whiskey. Period, end of story. That's the ration. I mean, that, that, that's the value. Okay? That's brilliant. Okay. Which then gives us another law. If for some reason, a fox is devoured two sacks, and he only has a supply of three, then what happens to the margin utility? It increases, and therefore the value of each of the three remaining sacks so they will have a higher value. It's the va a higher value that he attaches to having seed for the following year so that he can stay alive another year. Okay? On the other hand, if he finds that his fertilizer was more powerful than he had thought and he actually harvests six um, sacks, well then, the value, as, as the supply increases, the marginal utility of the good decreases and therefore its value decreases. And now you can solve the paradox of value. And then he went right on to solve it. Solve very easily, okay? If you were in a desert and you had a perfect, you had the, uh, I forget how much he paid for it. I don't know, was it the $4 million purple diamond that Kobe Bryant bought to assuage his wife's feelings when he was admitted committing adultery? You had that perfect diamond, purple, I think it was a purple diamond, in your pocket. And you're in the desert, and you haven't had water in three days, and I don't know how I think you can last four days or something without water. And someone had um, a pint of water. Would you would you trade the diamond for the pint of water? Of course you would. Of course you would. Okay. Why? Because in that situation, the marginal utility of water, which is keeping you alive for another four days, okay, 
is much higher than the marginal utility of the diamond. In a normal situation, the reason why water has a lower exchange value than diamonds is simply because water has such a low margin utility because of its abundance that if you lose a gallon of water, it drips out of your um, faucet, okay, you lose a few cents worth of, of, of goods and services. Okay. Whereas in the case of diamonds, since they are relatively scarce to other goods in a normal situation, their margin utility and value is higher. But that can easily change if you change the situation. So diamonds aren't more valuable than water, okay? In uh, uh, or, or, or or let's put it this way, um, you, there, there is no paradox. In other words, diamonds don't have a higher exchange value and a lower use value than water. In fact, in those situations in which they sell at a higher price than water, okay, let's say a gallon of water sells for much less than 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 a, than a, than a diamond. The reason is that diamonds have a higher margin utility, a higher subjective value than does water. But that situation can change. Um, just to give you a, a, another example, um, my son just got his license last year, but um, you know, people, in, you know, we bought another car and so on. So we have three cars, and my wife does some part-time work, and I, I work full-time. Well, let's say um, I crack up my car. And let's say the cars are pretty interchangeable. Okay, he wouldn't be caught dead driving my car, but let's assume that they're pretty interchangeable. Um, well, do I stop? Do I not? Not do, do I go out without the car? Of course not. You know, Junior loses his car. Why? Because that's the third in my eyes, and I'm you know, the patriarch, so I, I, I set the value scale for the family. Well, my wife would argue about that, but. So we have a family value scale. Junior, his is his is last. That's the lowest use rank value. You know, a teenager driving around. I mean, that's the lowest rank value as far as I can see. Um, okay. Um, now you have two cars. Now each of the remaining two cars are more valuable because now two more, a more important want depends on losing one of those cars. Okay. Finally, just as a little um, exercise, let's say there's a farmer who has horses and cows. Okay, and the horses and cows are not interchangeable. Well, Lord Marge utility applies to many, many goods, because we're always trying to divide our money income according to which goods are most important to us, okay, over a whole uh, array of goods. And let's say that um, here's the, the way that the farmer ranks them. Horse number one is ranked highest because that's the horse he uses to plow so that he can um, may, uh, have a, uh, a crop the next year. Horse number two is also used as a plow horse, makes his job even easier. Okay, and makes him, makes uh, his farm more productive. Cow number one is the third most important animal. Okay, because uh, in this particular case, the cow um, will be used for milk for the farm family. A uh, cow number four, or cow number two, excuse me, cow two, serves the fourth most important want, which is to have cheese and butter in addition to the milk. And then let's say he has three horses and two cows in this example. Fifth most important use is horse number three, which is used for riding, pleasure riding. Okay. Which animal is more valuable? Is a horse or a cow more valuable on this farm? Well, my undergraduates say, well, the horses are more valuable. Look, you know, the two most important wants. Of course, that's not true. Okay. You can tell it's not true. The barn is burning down. He can only save four animals. Which animal is he leaving a barn? A horse. Because the least important, the margin utility of the horse, you look down here, you don't look up here, the margin utility of the horse, and therefore its value is lower than the margin utility of the cow. Okay? Now, once that happens, and the horse perishes, what happens? The margin utility of horses jump up here, so they're more valuable than the margin utility of cows. That is, he prefers um, the extra wheat from a second plow horse that, to the cheese and butter he could get from the second cow. Okay? So all of, 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 of human action, can be explained by the law of margin utility in Menger's sense. Now, notice, did I add anything up? Did I did I say that there's a certain number of units of, of, of value or, 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 or satisfaction that people get from this? Of course not. You can't you can't quantify, let alone measure, utility. Okay. In some of your textbooks, you'll see though utils, right? Um, 
you know, I, I, I went to a Paul McCartney concert le, le, uh, two years ago. It was $125. And um, you know, I was more than happy to pay it. Um, I'd never seen any oh, Ringo in concert. But I, I'd never seen the Beatles in concert. They're my favorite band. So I, I paid $125 to go to Madison Square Garden to see Paul McCartney. Um, I also like Rod Stewart. But I didn't want to pay, or let, let me make this even. Let's, let's say I pay 120 to make this simple. Okay. Um, I was willing to pay up to $60 to see Rod Stewart. It was something like $75. I didn't go and see Rod Stewart, right? But the fact that I would pay up to $60 to see Rod, does that mean that I value the um, Paul McCartney's music as much as Rod Stewart? Of course not. It doesn't, doesn't mean that at all. Simply means that I value a Paul McCartney concert more than $120, less than $125, let's say, and I value Rod Stewart more than $60, but less than, than $75. It's just a ranking. Just a ranking. Just because money can be can be quantified or added up, it doesn't mean that. Uh, remember, money different individuals has to have has different value. Okay, you you can't compare uh, the value. But but it's even worse to say something like um, I I have a hundred. I got a hundred utils of, of of satisfaction from the Paul McCartney um, concert and the Rod Stewart concert would only give me fifty utils. Therefore, I prefer, or or the Paul McCartney concert is is twice as valuable to me as the um, Rod Stewart concert. Um, I mean, the question is, what the hell is a util? You can't. It has no extension in space. You can't measure it. Okay, in, in inches. You can't weigh it. Okay. It doesn't um, operate to raise a mercury column as temperature. There is no extension in, in objective reality. Okay, There is no unit of measurement of value, and there never can be. Unfortunately, Val Ross and Jevons thought that there was. Okay, And they actually you know, divided and uh, multiplied and added uh, marginal utility. Menger was, was, was um, shrewd enough to, to avoid that. Okay. Uh, now, what are some of the implications of uh, the law of margin utility? First of all, obviously, it resolves the paradox of value. There is no longer a conflict between use value and, and um, exchange value. Um, secondly, and very importantly, it makes us realize that value is imputed, and the Austrians like to use this word imputed, backwards. Okay? So, we say <coughs> imputed or imputation. What the Austrians say is that we start with satisfaction of wants, the value that you attach to that want being satisfied then determines the value of the service of the good in satisfying that want. And by not Menger, but his later, uh, his student, von Bavark, used the term rendition of service. He says, what's important about goods is not the, the physical object. It's the, their service in satisfying human wants. Okay? And the more services a good have has in, in satisfying the want, the more valuable the good is, okay? the consumer good is. The more valuable the consumer good is, the more valuable the inputs, the labor, the land, the capital goods. We'll call them all together producers' goods. So value goes this way. The classical, the classical, econ the classical economists have it exactly wrong. You turn the classical economists on their head. Value goes from the satisfaction of wants up to producers' goods. Okay? So, diamonds have a value, not because they're extremely costly to produce, but quite the opposite, because they satisfy very, very important wants. So, if you ever saw the movie Witness um, with Harrison Ford, which takes place in an Amish community in southeastern Pennsylvania, um, if you remember the Amish, they um, eschew or avoid all sorts of ornamentation on their clothing. They don't even have buttons. Okay, They just use these little hooks to keep their clothing clasped together. 
Um, now, take the Amish scale of values. What would happen to the value of gem quality diamonds if all Americans adopted Amish values? It would go down to zero. Assuming there's no industrial use of diamonds, it would fall to zero. Okay? What would happen, therefore, to the, to the high wages that um, the very good skilled jewelers get? Fall to zero. What would happen to the um, value of diamond mines? Stock, stock and diamond mines. Fall to zero. So you see, it's a consumer that determines the value of, of not only the consumer good, but of all the producer's goods. Okay? And Menger recognized that. That there's an imputation from the satisfaction of wants backwards. Now, he never denied that production goes this way. The double causality. Okay? The combination of producer's goods cause output of consumer goods, which in turn when consumed, call, give a rendition of service, that satisfies the causality is two-way. Okay? In other words, the value and production causality run in opposite directions. And what's important is that the causality goes from the subjective to the objective and back to the subjective. Okay? There's an, some Austrians believe that all economics is purely subjectivist. That's not true. These external elements that when combined and used satisfy human wants or are objective. Okay? The best economist at stressing that was von Baver, who was Mitter's um, uh, student. Okay. Finally, um, remember that value is not an intrinsic quality of a, of a good. Okay. No matter how much it costs someone to build a, to build a building, let's say, if that building is so grotesque looking, that no one wants to rent rooms in that building, well then that building's gonna have zero value. Regardless of how many hours of labor was bestowed on, on that building in, 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 in um, constructing it. All right. Okay, now, uh, let me talk about the objective world here. Because Menger had some things to say about that. Okay, he focused on goods. Again, it's often thought that Austrians don't talk about the objective world, but, but they have a, something called a structure of production. We call it in modern terms, but Menger called it orders of goods. That talks about the logical connection between these, uh, these objective quantities of goods. Let me just very quick, because I want to do this and one other thing before I stop, uh, very quickly point out what are orders of goods. Menger said that there are higher order and lower order goods. The higher order goods are goods that are further away from consumer goods. The, the, the higher the order of the good, the further away they are from directly satisfying a human want. So, let's start with the sixth, fifth, and let's talk about the production of bread. Okay? In other words, production can be conceived in terms of orders of, of producer's goods. Third, second, and first. First order is always a consumer good. So, if we're talking about bread, it's bread at a retail store. Okay. But in order to produce that bread, you know, someone had to um, uh, have, you know, flour and ovens and um, baker's labor and transportation trucks to get the bread to the retail stores and so on. Okay? That's the second order good. Or goods. Third order goods we could have flour. Somebody had to have a, a mill to grind the wheat. Okay, and they had to have the miller, the miller's labors, labor. And but, but before that, somebody had to produce the wheat. So we had to have land, plows, plows, yeah. Okay, land, plows, two of tools, farm tools, and so on. Okay. And before that. In order to produce the, the plows and tools, someone had to have um, iron ore, and labor, and before they had that, someone had to have a mine, and miners labor, and have miners and, and a mine, put them together, get the iron ore, the labor, I, I miss steel in here somewhere, the steel, turn the iron ore, with uh, more labor into steel, and then turn them into plows and tools. But you see, um, production moves this way. Now, what Menger said was the value of the second order of goods depends on 
the value consumers attach to the to, to bread at retail. This value is computed back to here. But the value of flour ovens, bakers, and trucks is imputed back to the mill, the wheat, and the miller's labor. Okay? These were these goods were called complementary goods. The goods that you have to combine to get the next order goods in the process of production for complementary goods. In other words, goods that are used together. Okay. So what Menger pointed out is that, in fact, you, we can tell the total value of the second order goods is going to be equal to the total value of the first order goods. The total value of the third order goods is going to be equal to the total value of the second order goods, and so on further back. He then went on and said, but, but what about the value of a particular unit? Remember, Wall Street's are always focused on the value of a particular concrete unit of a good. Okay? What is the value here in the fourth order up here, um, where we're um, third order? Let's say uh, up here. Okay? What's the value of 100 pounds of fertilizer? Okay? How can we separate that out? when the total value of the fourth order goods depends on the total value of the third order goods. Well, here again, he had a brilliant method of figuring out the value of, of higher order goods. Okay. And it was similar to the way he arrived at the law of marginal utility. He didn't use this term, later economists did, but this is called the law of marginal productivity. And he only focused on an individual uh, producer. He wasn't focusing uh, in his textbook, which was really only an introduction to overall economics. He wasn't focusing on um, established markets and, and, and businesses and so on. Okay, he was building up to that, and he got to it at the end of his book to some extent. The market for consumers good. But let me. I'll end with this. Uh, let's take a very very simple example, which seems complex at first. Let's say you have a production function, and that you know that 100 bushels of bread okay, can be produced if you add together 90 days of labor plus two horses, okay, to pull the plow, plus one plow, plus 10 acres of land, plus 500 pounds of fertilizer. Okay? What is the value of 100 pounds of fertilizer? Well, Menger said the following. Very easy way to figure that out. Let's say, since you can, you can use more or less fertilizer, okay? He says, let's, let's assume variable proportions. That is, we can use uh, 50 days of labor, okay, and combine it with these things, or we can use 300 pounds of fertilizer and combine it with these things, or we can use one horse instead of two horses, okay? Or we can use five acres, okay? So if you can vary the amounts that you use in a production process, well, then it's easy to figure out the value of a particular concrete unit of producer's goods. He said, and, I, and now this is an example I made up. He uses a, a different example. Let's say that the farmer loses 100 pounds of fertilizer, bad rainstorm, it gets washed, it gets washed away, okay? So now this only has 400. And let's say then, therefore, this output falls to 95 bushels of, of um, wheat. Okay. Well then, the value of 100 pounds of, of fertilizer, or 100 weight of fertilizer, is what? The value that he attaches, or the margin utility, of 5 bushels of, of wheat. Okay. And if, if you want to go to a market and you say that um, uh, wheat uh, is for three dollars a bushel, okay, if you want to introduce the market here, and he loses five bushels, then he's willing to pay up to how much for for a hundred pounds of fertilizer? Fifteen dollars. Okay. So Menger had a, a brilliant solution. Okay. Um, do I have where's is Mark here? Do I have one more minute? Okay, one minute. I, I, okay. The last thing that Menger did, uh, which um, Corrected a uh, four in the classical school. I quickly want to uh, talk about exchange. Very simple. Um, Menger said the important thing about exchange is not that two things that are equivalent in value are exchanged. In fact, the valuations are reversed. 
Okay, if people are going to exchange, if a former A and a former B, if former A trades one horse for one cow, so that B gets the horse, A gets the cow, it implies then that A values the cow more than the horse, well, he wouldn't give the horse up, and B values the horse more than the cow. So, contrary to Adam Smith, the reason why people who said that, that human beings have a propensity to barter and truck, in other words, there's something in us that makes us want to exchange, it's almost like a game, he said, no, that's not true. We always exchange so that we can increase the value of the goods that we have. Okay? And the final point that I want to make is that it even tells you this analysis how many goods will be exchanged. Because let's say A had five horses and B had five cows. How many would be exchanged? Well, as long as the additional horse or the additional cow has a higher value to A and the additional horse has a higher value to C, they're going to continue to exchange. Okay? But at some point, let's say after the third horse, or at the third horse, A says, you know what? The third cow has a lower value to me, so he has a third horse here. Um, and he ranks the third horse above the third cow. If that's true, is he going to exchange his horse, a third horse for a third cow? No. So he will only exchange how many horses? Two. Regardless of what B wants to do. Okay. In other words, you have to have reverse values for exchange to take place. Okay. Uh, we'll stop there. Thank you.